Good afternoon, everyone. I call this January 11th, 2024, Jacksonville Water and Sewer Advisory Committee meeting to order. Mr. Vice, do we have a quorum? Yes, Mr. Chairman, we have a quorum. Right. Thank you. Uh, first order of business, uh, of course, I want to wish everyone a uh, happy new year. Uh, first meeting of the year, so it's going to be good. Uh, has everyone had a chance to review the agenda items? Yes. Are there any discussions? Hearing none, I will accept the motion to adopt the agenda. Second. 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 Thank you. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Agenda adapted. Has everyone had a chance to review October's last meeting's minutes? Are there any omissions or corrections to those minutes? <clears throat> All right, hearing none, I'll accept the motion to accept the minutes as written. So moved. Right, second? Second. Thank you. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motions carries. All right, again, welcome everyone to this uh, New Year's meeting. And uh, in saying so, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Hess. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, committee members. Uh, tonight, we're going to start discussion of the capital uh, improvement plan process. We do this annually. We, we really kick off in November the, the start of the uh, planning process for the 10-year capital improvement plan. And one of the first things that we did with you uh, right after the, the new year each year is come to you and bring the current projects that we're working on that are identified in the current capital improvement plan. So tonight, uh, Christy and Randa are going to discuss the uh, water and sewer projects that we have, uh, give you status updates of all of the current projects, answer any questions you have. If there's you know, a project that you know the city is working on, but not necessarily a water and sewer project, and you have a question about one of those, we'll try to answer those as well. Um, because the, while engineering does water and sewer, they also do all of the other projects in the city. So with that, I'll turn it over to them. They'll go through the projects, and then right at the end, I'll talk a little bit about what the next steps are and what we can expect at our, our next couple of meetings. Good evening, all. Um, as Wally said, Christy and I will be giving you a status update on the FY8, the fiscal year 24 projects. But first, I want to go over the capital improvement plan and kind of what that entails. Uh, again, it's our tenure. It's a 10-year horizon. The one we're drafting up right now is the FY8 the fiscal year 25 through fiscal year 34. Our capital improvement plan is updated <clears throat> annually. It's used to evaluate the water and sewer rates as well as calculating our system development fees. Um, when it's adopted, it's only that first year that is funded. Uh, CIP projects, those are <clears throat> anything longer than 12 months to complete. The cost would exceed $50,000, and it has a greater than five-year useful life. Uh, it, they're usually either some sort of replacement and repair. Those come from work orders, from utility maintenance. Or, but we also do new infrastructure and upgrades depending on our growth here. The types of CIP projects, we have our rehabilitation, we have improvement and growth as well. Uh, the rehabilitation projects, those focus on repair to extend the useful life of the infrastructure. We also replace deteriorated infrastructure, but we don't change the size or capacity of that infrastructure. This is funded through monthly water and sewer rates. Improvement projects, we also replace deteriorated infrastructure. It reduces pressure on existing infrastructure. It can also add a capacity. It just depends. Um, and it provides for existing and future development. These projects are funded through monthly water and sewer rates, as well as the system development fees. 
And then the last one are our growth projects. These are usually new infrastructure. Uh, this usually is some sort of increase in capacity um, and it's to provide for future growth. These are funded through system development fees as well as water and sewer service areas. What is a water and sewer service area? So we have, um, if you remember back in 2009, 10 time frame, uh, the country as a whole had gone through a recession and funding became very challenging for development. In order to try to help um, keep development and growth moving forward, one of the things the city did was reevaluate how we um, require and help fund uh, water and sewer extension and infrastructure, infrastructure. projects. Yeah. One of the ways we came up with doing that is, um, you know, development really pays for itself. The private developer goes out, puts in all the infrastructure, builds it, the city specs, and then turns it over to the city to maintain. So really, most of the city infrastructure, unless it's major pump stations, those kind of things, or replacements or upgrades, most of the new stuff is put in you know, with the construction of Carolina Forest or yeah. Williamsburg Plantation or Gateway Marketplace. Private, private developers. Private developers put it in. <clears throat> um, when, when funding became very challenging, one of the things the city said is, you know, if you're willing to annex and do other things um, with set milestones, we will upfront some of the cost for water and sewer infrastructure. And the way we recover that cost is take the capacity of whatever we've invested in and then we charge it back to the development as it develops. So it's really a an additional system development fee. It's an additional so they pay fee basically. Exactly. And most of the developers really were very we've only had a few use it, yeah. but they were very excited about that because they didn't have to carry that debt. Right. The city actually carried that debt. The challenge we ran into in some cases is the city's out there with debt in well in front of development. So in one or two cases, it worked out really well. And in one or two cases, the city has an investment that we haven't recaptured our original investment. But at the time that that capacity is used, we will recapture that. Okay. So it's... It's really a system development fee, but it's only specific to a certain area for um, that development. Okay. I'm gonna rewind back to the CIP definition. So it said greater than a year, more than $50,000. If it's more than $50,000, but less than a year, is it CIP project? Is it an and all things or a no, so all things? No, it's a, it, Typically, if it were greater than $50,000, but it takes less than a year to construct, most of the times, most of the time, not all, but most of the time, that's typically a repair or something we're doing through our operational budget, okay. which is why it doesn't show up in the CIP. It's not a always, but it's a most of the time. And and what we found is by the time we, we kind of include the design time frame into that year, by the time you do engineering, design, permitting, construction, it's a year. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. Probably too realistic, um, even for a small project. So the you know where we would do something that takes us less than a year, but it's more than fifty thousand, it would be covered through our operating budget. Okay. Uh, again, Chrissy and I will be covering the projects from fiscal year 24. Next month, we'll be coming back to go over new projects for the fiscal year 25 and discuss also projects that we'll be carrying over. And then in March is when the draft of the capital improvement plan will be brought in front of you guys. Okay. So the, the projects we're going over were either carried over from the previous year or the projects that are ongoing as well as new projects. And I don't think we actually introduced new projects last year, but um, so the first ones we're gonna go over are the water projects. Uh, the Black Creek well replacement. Currently the design and permitting is completed for well one. 
there was a full well chemical analysis completed. However, due to that, it's kind of on hold. We're trying to find some other options. Um, we're waiting on another analysis, I believe. And then we're gonna also evaluate some other wells and options for that. So what happened here is well one is a well that the city has had um, as part of our system since the 70s. Um, but because of changes in our system <clears throat> and the way well one tied in, we have not used it in the entire time I've been here. Really? So it just, it, the way that it's tied into the system, it gets knocked off of its pump curve. So anytime we operate one of the other Black Creek wells, it shuts it down. So like anything else, it became used to scavenge parts off of and other things. So it, it literally sat, we, we monitor it, test it every month, but we haven't, we had not had it online. So we looked at um, wells one through five and We've talked about those, you know, at pretty good length, but we need to reconfigure some of those wells. So the idea was, let's go back to well one. It was one of the larger producers when it was installed. We camered it, it looked pretty good. Long story short, when we ran a, a full chemical analysis, which is what you would typically do if you were drilling a new well, um, which was a recommendation of the well driller that we had um, which turned out to be a very good recommendation. What we found is it has high fluoride levels, naturally occurring high fluoride levels, to the point where um, it does not um, cross the primary threshold, but it does cross the secondary threshold. So if we put well one back online, every year when we do our consumer confidence report, we would have to issue a statement that says we have a well that tests over the secondary limit and um, at that limit, it can cause the browning of teeth and other things. Um, and if you go over the primary limit, it can cause cancer. Um, and it's not somewhere we really wanna go. We don't want to have to, um, I, you know, I just, I can't say that we wanna have to go forward to spend you know, a half million dollars on infrastructure knowing that we're always going to have to report above. Now, in actuality, there's really no danger um, because that well would be such a small portion of our system and blended in that there would be no impact to the consumer. The problem is it's a point source testing. So once you trigger that point source, you have to report it. Gotcha. So we're we're kind of on hold saying you know that's probably not where we want to spend our money so now we got to figure out what we're going to do so so why would why would the testing be there differently is it shallower is it i can't than, than other no it's not? it's not it's it's got to be it, jokingly i said we must have drilled into some dinosaur bones or something yeah. because um there's a well, well number two is very close and it's much lower and ironically the longer you pump it the higher it is, not wow. you pump it and then wow. it starts. That's what we anticipated, that you would start pumping it and you would remove whatever that naturally occurring substance is. But in all of our tests, as it ran, it still continued. It's still well well below the primary right. of four, but I mean, it was above two. So, you know, most of ours are below one. Gotcha. So. Good. And I am not a chemist, so I just know we don't want to have to report something that's not, we, you know, in this today's age, we don't want right. to report something and have people worried for something that's You'll be really not a, a whole concern. Lot of phone calls and questions and concerns. Exactly. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and have invested a lot of money to do it. So right. it just yeah. doesn't make sense. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, the next project is the Branchwood water line. It's actually the water line service replacement. This is actually designed and the specs are completed. We're ready to put it out for bid. However, there's some sewer repairs that need to go on in that same area. So we're really trying to coordinate that work to where we're not going out, doing work, digging up these roads, these areas, putting everything back only to come back and do. So we're really trying to coordinate that work right now. The plan is to bid it out early fiscal year 25, so. Okay. 
Uh, the Bryn Mawr water tank upgrades, the study and design are completed. Uh, we have our construction estimates for this. However, those estimates show that we're probably gonna have to come in and ask for some more funding for this project so we can bid it out and get it under construction. So that will be the next step is requesting additional funding for this project here. Could you summarize the upgrades you're talking about? I mean, sure. It's a, if you recall, this station, this, this water tank, we actually don't use for a water tank. It's a cellular phone tower. So it's uh, um, so it does provide benefit to our system because we get revenue off of it. But the commons is so high that when we put this one online, it actually pushes water out the top. So the um, the upgrades for this is to actually install a booster station. So it'll have a check valve with a booster station, and it's the cost of that check valve booster station and everything that goes along with it to put that tank back online. Um, so, and we, we have done some value engineering working with our engineer originally. Um, you know, they, they used a um, safety factor of three. So the thought was we want to be able to, if we have to turn that, that tank over three times in a day. So it was a, it's a half million gallon tank. Um, so it was a one and a half million gallon pump and you have to have backup and generator and everything to go along with that. And when we talked to our engineer, we said, you know, the likelihood of us having to do that is very <coughs> unlikely. So let's talk something more realistic. And now we're down closer to about a million gallons a day, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so which is much more reasonable, but is still above what our initial estimate is. Which I hate to say in this big climate is, uh, is going to be some of our projects. Probably going to be all of them. Yeah, I mean, I was hoping, I was more optimistic yeah. than that, yeah. but it's going to be a lot of them. It's, it's crazy. Next project is the bypass line cartridge filters. Uh, currently, the planning and design is completed. The canisters have been ordered. And actually, they're literally, I would give it a day or two, and it'll be posted on BitNet. So we're planning to construct the piping changes and get the installation completed. The Gum Branch Central Chlorine Scrubber. The, we received the proposals for this for the scrubber and the installation. Um, we are requesting or have requested, we're going to request the <coughs> exemption for standardization purposes. This is so that um, the, the chlorine scrubber at, is it Bryn LTS? Or, or LTS, uh, the person that did that one and that oversees that one, they can do the same. It would just make it a lot more efficient for us. Um, if Easier we have the maintenance, same, thing, yes. yeah. same chemicals. So once we get that, then we're hoping to get construction started early fiscal year 25. <laughs> and that's all for the water projects. Did y'all have any more yeah. questions about the water project? Nope. All right. I'm going to talk to you about the sewer projects. Um, the first one is the Western Regional Sewer System. Current status is Phase 1 is under construction, and we are looking to bid Phase 2 in February. And then looking forward for fiscal year 25, uh, we're going to do the bid pump station and for the LTS in the fall. Holiday City Mobile Home Park lift station. The current status is we are planning and evaluating it. Um, we are reviewing alternatives. There is a parcel of land that is for sale there that will possibly um, impact this lift station. Um, and we may have to go to a larger size pump. So obviously that will um, come into play for the completing the design. So fiscal year 25, we look to complete that design and prepare it to bid. Ellis Pump Station, this one is completed. As you can see on the left, that was Hurricane Florence. And the one to the right is the pump station with the site improvements for the emergency response facility up on the hill, um, which has the biofilter, the generator, and the bypass pump. And we can, so the thought now is we can't prevent 
the picture on the left from happening in the future. But what we will do is basically mm -hmm. the station is now watertight. So if it floods, we can operate and run everything from up on this pad that you see. And there's actually a bypass pump on the right-hand side to where um, we can actually put the station in complete bypass and literally run it from that one pump. Wow. So, um, and this was, this received FEMA fund funding and scored pretty well. I think we received 600 some thousand dollars in FEMA funding for this project. Shoreline Drive lift station elevation. The current status is the design is complete and we re are looking to bid the, um, out the design for the installation. And then in fiscal year 25, we expect their work to be completed. And that station floods all the time. It yeah. floods right over top of it. Yeah. So we want to make sure it's sealed up and <clears throat> And all of our controls are elevated so that we don't have to access it. And we actually have designed that one in-house with one of our cool. engineers. Um, Biofilter upgrade at Bryn Mawr. The current status is the gas study was completed. We already have our exemption for the standardization purposes. And we have obtained the proposal. Um, we're looking to purchase that biofilter in fiscal year 25 and bid the installation for the biofilter. Um, and that biofilter will be the exact same biofilter that we purchased for Ellis Pump Station. Those stations are very similar, um, and that way, same thing with the maintenance, and um, it'll be easier for our guys to maintain and parts remove. LTS facility improvements. So here is the chlorine scrubber that we installed that we're talking about doing the same thing at Gum Ranch Central Chlorine. And fiscal year 25, we're going to upgrade the controls, improve the SCADA, and station improvements. <clears throat> fiscal year 22-23, inflow and infiltration, the current status. Um, we did initially identify 14 areas of um, issues that we were looking to um, get repaired. However, we had to use additional funding for, or the remaining funding for the inflow and infiltration for the Highway 24 bypass where we had the piping failure. Um, but that has been completed. Um, we've had that pipe lined. Um, so fiscal year 25, we're going to continue our evaluations um, until we can get additional funding. Well, these are the one that you put the sock in there and it, yes, it yes. covers it up, makes it like a new pipe. Yeah. And it, it actually, so if you'll remember back before Christmas, we talked about, I think it was actually the October meeting, mm -hmm. I gave you an update, said that we were having problems and that the hydrogen sulfide gas had actually um, corroded the inside of the concrete pipes so much that the gaskets had fallen at the joints. Yeah. So we went through and cut those out, but we, I mean, rebar was exposed all on the inside of the pipe we we're having pipe failures, we were having infiltration. So we were actually able to use this project to go in, line those pipes, um, and basically rehabilitate that section. And if it hadn't have been for that, we would have either had to have gone to council to ask for money, or probably would have been in a lot of trouble on our operating budget. So it worked out very well that we were able to shift focus. I mean. That's the point of the I and I project is to rehabilitate um, sewer infrastructure and eliminate I and I. So it went hand in hand with that project, but I think we ended up spending about four hundred thousand dollars on that project, and it would have been a lot more. But our in-house staff, TJ's crews, are the ones that rented the bypass pumps, set up all the piping, did all of that work. Really, the the con the only contractor we used was to come in and do the cutting because we don't have a camera that can cut and to do the lining part. So we actually saved a ton of money with that bypass. And of course, along with that is risk. So because we set up all the bypass pumping, we, the city, accepted all of that risk. We didn't pay somebody to. So we didn't pay somebody to take that risk. So that was, that's probably the largest saving piece of that. So that was concrete sewer pipe? Yes, sir. 24 inch. Wow.
So, and you can see from the camera, when you camera it, wow. you can actually see, you know, it's a rebar mesh. Mm -hmm. So that rebar mesh is generally, you know, the middle diam in the middle of the oh, diameter right. pipe. And you can see the mesh wow. on the mm -hmm. pipe. And these things are good for what, 50 years, you said? or So it, typically, um, the infrastructure, in-ground in infrastructure, ranges anywhere from 70 to 100. Um, we're, our, the, the schedule that we're on, we look more at the 70 range, mm -hmm. depending on what it is. Um, but, uh, you know, I hate to say it, a lot of that is depending on, you know, how it's maintained, what soils it's installed in, what's running through it. This one has Ellis Pump Station, which we just talked about that has a force main that directly flows into that. And if you looked at, you know, when we got that pipe bypassed, cleaned all out, from about the middle of the pipe down, looked perfectly fine, which is where all the sewer flows. From the middle of the pipe up is what was so bad. Wow. So what that tells us is it's not the fluid that is the wow. problem, it's yes. the gases. Yeah, wow. So, it was, and the hydrogen sulfide gas just almost turns concrete to sand. It looked like beach sand in the bottom of the, um, in the pipe when we cleaned it out. And so that was 24 inch pipe. And so y'all lined 24 inch pipe. Yes. So I can't say that, that that pipe's good for another 50 years, but it should be good for another 20. Yeah. Wow. So, and it's a, I don't remember the thickness of the liner, but it's about a quarter inch thick or so. So how, uh. How long a section is that? that we did, um, I should know this, we did, <clears throat> I want to say we did about seven or 800 feet. Um, we didn't do all of it on that side of the road though, because there are, there was sections that, so we, we went from under the bypass um, up to um, the Montfort Point, uh, yeah. Memorial, but from the Montfort Point Memorial back to um, basically where the Beirut Memorial is, right in that area, it turns and goes under 24. We haven't done that leg yet. Um, but part of the reason we didn't do that leg is um, at, at City Council on Tuesday night, we talked about um, purchasing policies and, and state purchasing requirement. When there's an emergency, it gives the city, the authority to spend money without having to go out and get bids and those kind of things because of the time. Well, that was a, that was a true emergency. So we used the emergency purchasing, which means we just, we could go negotiate a price with somebody to get the work done. Gotcha. The portion from Montfort Point up and under is not an emergency. So it needs to be done but we need to go through our normal bidding process. and project process to get that work done. So, all right. No avenue sewer replacement. Um, the current status is the design is complete and we're preparing to bid this. We're looking to complete the project in fiscal year 25. The next um, section I'm gonna talk about are the water and sewer projects combined. New Bridge Streetscape, current status is the new water line has been installed and the storm drain installation is underway. Fiscal year 25, we are expecting to have this project completed late 2024. Fiscal year 23 infrastructure rehab, the current status of the DeWitt Street and North Bayshore surveys have been completed. We are currently waiting on the cost estimate and design from the engineering firm. And fiscal year 25, we're looking to begin construction. And when you talk about one that's going to need more money, it will be DeWitt Street. Mm -hmm. there, we don't know what that will come out to yet. Some of that is still based off the survey. You know, we did a kind of a desktop evaluation and said, based on what we see, we think it'll be this many feet of sewer. But when they actually get the full evaluation done, we'll find out. But that's that one would be a safe bet. We're we're gonna need money on to finish that project. It does. It's still when Christy and I met with the engineers. It does look like that northern portion of Dewitt Street will be. We can line it. That will save us a lot of money. But that lower portion, that's where 
there are a lot of issues, but I mean, you could tell right away. So, yeah. but we should. You can drive down the there. street and you can tell. Yes. Yeah. US 17 North Drummer Kellum Water and Sewer Extension. Um, the current status, the design is complete, complete, and we do have the permits obtained. We are currently waiting on a cost estimate and the specifications so that we can get this out to bid and we look to construct it in fiscal year 25. And you ask about the sewer service area of funding. This is actually one of those that was an agreement and it's that that probably was in our CIP for um, three or four years and it didn't move forward. The property did get annexed, but the project didn't move forward. Um, so it just you know, kind of went into a holding pattern and the engineer that represents the developer contacted us and said they're looking at moving forward. Yeah. So now we'll, we'll look at moving that project forward as they move forward with their um, submittals. Okay. All right. Did you, anybody so, have any questions on the water and sewer projects or so, sewer projects? So you mentioned the new bridge. You said late 2024. Is yes. that just the water sewer or is that the complete that, project? That's supposed to be the complete project, yes, sir. So a couple of things I want to highlight. Um, you know, I know that you've probably heard Randa and Christy say a couple of times, you know, we, we purchased, you know, and a great example is the cartridge filter for the bypass line at the water treatment plant. Uh, that project is to add filtration to our bypass line, and we've talked about that before, but we had that project designed, bid out, and it came in way over budget, so much so that we said we've, we've got to back up and look at what our options are. So I think, you know, one of the things that Christy and, and Randa and the rest of our engineering staff deserve credit on is some of the things that they've done is look at projects and try to figure out is there other ways to get them done or do them differently. So that project, the the biofilter for um, Bryn Mawr pump station, the chlorine scrubber, and maybe one other, they've actually taken it and instead of doing a traditional design, bid out the entire project and hire somebody to install it what they've done is said all right we can contract with a manufacturer to produce these products the city will go out and buy those procure those so we don't pay markup we're paying you know basically what a contractor would and then we contract out the work to just install it um and it and actually i believe you did that on ellis also and you know it's it's not a lot, but it does save 20% yeah. at least on anything we do that. And we talk about a chlorine scrubber that's $400,000 on its own, just a piece of equipment, 20% makes yeah. a difference. Sure. So credit to them because they are doing those kind of things. <clears throat> yeah. um, so <clears throat> just going forward, you know, tonight <clears throat> we're talking, you have an update of the projects that we have ongoing. Like I said, those are the water and sewer projects. We do have other projects like street paving projects and those kind of things. So if you have any questions about those, we'll be happy to answer them. As we look at the next couple of months, um, we have some other things that we'll need to discuss. You know, we talked about the current year. We also have nine more years of a CIP that's already out there and identified. We'll be bringing that back to you for you to look at. Um, we've talked about the, you know, the, the rate analysis and what goes into the model. Um, we talked, you know, at the beginning, Randa went over the different methods of funding, the different types of, uh, projects and operations, whether mm -hmm. that is through system development fees or whether that's through the monthly rate or whether that's through the service, uh, sewer service area fees. Um, all of that is what's used to program into our bottle. Um, so we will be working on, you know, as we're pulling together the draft of our CIP for you to review, we will also be working on getting that into our model. And then we'll bring that back to you to review um, at various steps. You know, uh, it's, it's basically a 10-year program. You can't 
take and, and a bite out of that all in one night. Um, so we'll bring that over to, to you over probably the next three meetings. And then we'll ask for you to support the water and sewer projects uh, to city council. And then all of that will be presented to city council. So this is kind of that schedule. Um, this is the schedule that we use every year. You've seen this before. Um, and then there's the timeline. What I will say is that's what it looks like this year. Um, the new manager as part of the budget process has asked us to look at trying to prioritize the CIP and slide it forward within the, the budget process because it's such a big part of the budget. So while we, while we are trying to accelerate this process for this year, most likely next year, you'll be seeing this before Christmas. So we'll probably be bringing you an update in the October, November timeframe with a um, draft in the January, or I mean, December timeframe and, and more of a hopeful uh, approval or, or at least consideration for recommendation in the January, maybe early February timeframe. And again, the reason is trying to get that CIP process moved up because it is such a, a large and important part of the budget. Right now, the way it works is CIP and budget kind of run concurrently and then get merged together. And he wants to see that more streamlined. So, um, which will mean that that timeline that we have, that model we have been working on will probably end up needing to shift more. So it may be that, you know, we get new projects approved in July and August, we start talking about what we need for next year. So um, just be prepared for, for that discussion as we move forward. So with that, I really don't have anything else related to the CIP, Mr. Chairman, unless there's any questions. I mean, <clears throat> everything we've heard today, I mean, it's just right on target with what you folks are trying to do. And obviously the big goal here is among taking care of the city projects and everything that's going on is keeping the, the, the bills to the citizens as low as possible. That's, that's the end state goal, because that's what they care about. And we, you folks ought to do the same thing. So that's appreciated doing everything you're doing to save us, save the citizens a lot of money. So that's always a good thing. Um, other than that, do we have any other questions for, for our briefers? Uh, have you not been thinking about taking a look back if we might want to Maybe not want to, but maybe we should look back at our Piney Green sewer project and give us a review of okay. where that's been, sure. where it is, where well, we're using it. And, sure. Yeah. We can do that. It's some kind of retrospective. Okay. So put it on, put it I, on the yeah, I'll put it on a future, yeah. maybe yeah. next month or yeah. sometime. Yep. Yeah. No rush. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. I'd be happy to. Is there no, all these briefs that you brief? Like I know Derek sends us the copies of the briefs of, so we can read it, yeah. you know, focus on that. And those are very helpful. Yeah. You know, especially when you show pictures and this is what it looks like. So, okay, that's interesting. Because other than being there on site, you, mm -hmm. you know, unless you're not involved in it, only you don't see it. But that, that that's always very helpful. With the, Thank you for sending that out. Um, and finishing with all that, do we have any, uh, during our open discussions, anything that you would like to cover while we have the... Uh, the folks here. I have a couple of things, if that's all right. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, first, I'll start with Tuesday night storm because it was very interesting. Um, the city did, you know, the city did have crews that remained on on call and on site throughout the storm. Um, we really had that through public services had that through streets and stormwater, and then. Utilities, maintenance, the water plant, and the wastewater plant. So uh, we were engaged across the board. We had, um, in utilities maintenance, we had crews that ran throughout the entire event. We lost power at multiple lift stations. Um, main pump station in particular ran on uh, generator power for a couple of hours because it was on the, it's somehow on the, I can't say circuit is the right word, but it goes out at about the same time downtown goes out. So um, that is obviously a concern for us, but the generator ran, we had no problems. Um, but that is something that we closely monitor and we had people at that station throughout the storm. Um, Ford Street, 
uh, required a portable generator. It does not have a fixed generator. Um, one of the decisions the city has made in the past is that we do not have, we have 45 lift stations. We do not have generators at every lift station. We actually have multiple smaller lift stations that have what we call a plug or a pigtail and we have portable generators and we have staff that literally run generators around, pump down the station and go on to the next one. Uh, it's a lot of effort. It requires a lot of staff time when you have to do it, but it also saves on maintenance and cost of fixed mount generators. So and up there's front a, cost. And, and upfront yeah. costs. Yes. Yeah. So there's a, you know, there's, I can tell you from a wastewater standpoint, my crews would love to see permanent, mm -hmm. but they also recognize the, you know, that piece of there's the upfront cost, the ongoing maintenance, the, if it fails, you still have to deal with it. So, um, on average, how many times a year does that have to happen? We've do through every storm, any power outage, we do that. And we have list stations all around, um, the city. So if, if there's an outage in an area, it typically affects at least one or two of our lift stations. Um, it's just, it depends on size, but all of, you know, if you're talking our major stations, they all have yeah. fixed generators and we maintain them and operate them weekly. Um, so, but it is a, it's a conscious decision, right? It's, you know, if we were thinking, if you're the, the simple straight line is we should put generators everywhere. Um, but that adds to cost. So we, we choose to, to run a higher staff cost during those emergencies. What would it cost to put a generator each one? Just a rough, give an idea. Uh, we're, put, oh. we're putting one in a project in Kinston right now. And it's, uh, I don't, I don't even know how big the, the, the lift station is. I mean, but the backup, the backup generator is, Eighty-five to a hundred thousand dollars. I was going to say. I was going to say to have them at every station, you'd probably be looking around a hundred thousand dollars a station. And how many were there? But I don't know. We well, we have. I don't know how many we don't have. I think there's ten or twelve <clears throat> not on generator power. So, but some of those don't run. You know, but a couple hours a day. Yeah. So it would, it, it's a, it would be it's a good information to know how many incidents there yes. are within your system in a, in a given year. Yes. You know, do, do, do they have to show up at them 40 times right throughout the year or whatever? Yeah. And I don't think we're at that level. Yeah. That's the, so in it, that is a, a decision, you know, that was a decision that was made and that's an operational decision yeah. um, that we've continued with, but it does mean that during that period, we have staff working the entire storm. Yes. So there is a trade-off there. Um, so, in, and then Marine Plaza and Shoreline Drive, instead of running a generator over there, we just ran our jet truck over there and pumped and hauled it. Um, so we had, um, you know, and we have one partially clogged area, but we didn't have any SSOs. So that's great news. When you do the shoreline and you, and you raise it, do you have to get any neighborhood input on that since? So when uh, we do, the plan for shoreline drive is not to actually raise the wet well or anything. It's actually just to raise the controls. But it was so, that would be much of an eyesore or no? No, I think we'll actually, we're actually trying to work it so it would clean it up and put it more like in a, in a cabinet or it's like a, a water, signal it's box. It's a waterproof patch is yeah, what we're looking at. Okay. Yeah. Stainless steel waterproof patch. So we're, we're trying to, we would actually like to clean that area up. Um, if you go back to some of the old Google, um, you know, drive-by photos, you'll actually see where we've tried different things like building a rock berm around the, the wet well. We've tried putting stuff over the wet well to prevent flooding because what happens is the river floods, it just forces right into our system and inundates our system. So we're going to try to, we, we want to do something that's pleasing and um, that prevents the, the flooding and protects our controls. So, and then um, lastly, the elevated tanks, we didn't have any issues, no water walls or anything. The biggest um, thing was at the booster station, 
uh, we lost, uh, we had temporary VFD failure and lost power. And that booster station is over behind um, the old Ecom building for anybody that's familiar with that. It's the, um, we have a, a water tank there beside Cardinal Village Apartments. And ironically, I was going home from the city council meeting and made the left from um, Henderson Drive on the Gum Ranch. And because we have infrastructure there, I just happened to be looking and watched the transformer explode. So it was an wow. interesting sight. Um, so and apparently what ended up happening is a tree fell and knocked over a pole and the power lines. And that's what, that's what I saw. But um, so we, we had minimal damage, um, you know, mostly, mostly um, operational nuisances. You know, we, we were running around making sure that we didn't have any overflows and that our, our power, we were addressing our stations without power. Um, but our crews did an amazing job and that was all handled through um, staffing, normal staffing. So at LTS, we recorded um, just over an inch and a half of rain for that storm. Um, we received 8 million gallons of influent during that time period. Five is our normal um, during the month of December. So you can see that that's where the I and I comes in. Um, and then we had... So how do you measure that? We have flow meters at... Um, we have a influent meter at LTS and we have a effluent meter at the main pump station. So we actually have it measured in both places. So we track it and that's all the way we make sure we're not losing anything. Um, so, but we have, um, you know, we didn't have to divert to our ground storage tank or anything like that. So we got, we got through that storm, um, you know, with some, some nuisance, but yeah. nothing major. And then the, the last thing I wanted to kind of update you on, uh, one of the things that you'll be seeing in an upcoming meeting is a discussion on system development fees. Um, along with the, CIA, the capital improvement plan, we have um, a 10 year CIP. That all of those projects that are related to growth go into our system development fee. And the state law right now is that every five years you have to update your system development fee and we're at our five years. Um, we've already put out an RFQ for the company that's going to do that and we've hired that company. They're going through gathering all of our data um, and, and we will discuss at depth what that process is, what it looks like. And then basically what that study does is give council what the maximum supportable rate is. It doesn't tell them what they have to set it at, but it tells them what is supported by the, the fee structure. So if, you know, right now for a um, single family house, it's roughly about $7,100. That's based on what our maximum supportable rate is on our current fee schedule. And at that time, council did decide to adopt the maximum supportable fee. So the idea behind that is development kind of pays for itself. It pays for the infrastructure needed to grow the system. That's, that's basically what that means. Um, there are different methods. You Just because... 7,100 was the maximum supportable fee. It could have been that council decided to do 50% of that or 25% or of that to incentivize development. So that is a discussion that you will have coming before you um, in the next few months um, with that consultant. And then as, as we did the last time, most likely what we'll do is have a stakeholder meeting for the development community as well. And then I also anticipate um, a recommendation from this board on what you would like to see carry forward. Of course, ultimately that comes down to a council decision and is included in their fee schedule. But 
um, I just wanted to give you an update that you will be seeing that um, in the upcoming months as a uh, topic for discussion. Okay. No. <clears throat> well noted. Anybody else have anything else for the uh, for Wally and the crew? All right. Well, we thank you. It's very informative. It's always good to know all these things and uh, be prepared too. Because uh, as, as you all talking about these emergencies that are going on, we can't help to think, but hurricanes, seasons comes up. So all this sounds like a preparatory thing. Restaging generators where they need to be in case something goes down, prioritizing that. That's where I get out of all this when I start thinking about the generators and what have you, because we've dealt with that a lot. But anyways, uh, thank you very much for, for doing that. Uh, our next, in closing, our next meeting is going to be at 5.30 on Thursday, February 8th. 2024. Um, and if there's no other business, I will accept the motion to adjourn. So moved. All right, second. Second. All right. Stand adjourned.